Okay, could I have your attention, please? We're making a slight switch here so that uh, uh, Cammie Martin speaks after lunch and I speak uh, uh, now because I think that there's some uh, uh, issues that really mesh very nicely uh, in the lecture that I'm going to give you now in relationship to what has been uh, uh, discussed in her lecture and uh, Dr. Hayes' lecture yesterday. And uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, provide a little bit of a, a, a background again on uh, early parenteral and enteral nutrition. And you'll probably hear some things that are a little bit different than what you heard before, okay? So again, how do we go about nourishing this little 27-week, very premature baby? And as you heard from Cami, this is uh, an opportunity, a golden hour opportunity to nourish these babies. And we frequently do not provide early nutrition to these babies. And it's extremely important for us to do so because uh, some of these babies have such major energy deficits and protein deficits. And as you've seen before, the brain develops very rapidly during this period of time. And just to reiterate some of the studies you have heard about the brain, uh, here we have the work that was done by Richard Ehrenkrantz and re uh, reported a, couple, a few years ago looking at uh, weight gain quartile. So if you have a higher weight gain, here you have less MDI, less than 70. Higher weight gain, less PDI, less than 70. Same thing here with cerebral palsy and overall neurodevelopmental impairment at 18 months. And again, I just want to show you this, and you'll see this at least one more time a little bit later when we talk about lipids. In the first week, an increment of one gram per kilo per day can make a big difference in terms of mental development index and first week energy intake in terms of calories per kilo per day. 10 calories per kilo per day can make a big difference in terms of mental development index. There's also work very recently reported just uh, uh, in the last month in pediatric research showing that not just is ve this very early nutrition important in terms of brain development, it's important in the kinds of diseases that we see in our preterm babies. This is again work from Richard Ehrenkrantz and reported in pediatric research and this is the bottom line of this paper. As total energy intake during the first seven days of life increased in critically ill infants, the odds ratio of such adverse outcomes as NEC, late onset sepsis, BPD, and neurodevelopmental index decreased uh, uh, impairment uh, decreased by approximately 2% for each one calorie per kilo per day of total energy intake. So again, I want to reiterate that first week that we, that we have a golden opportunity here to improve a lot of outcomes in these babies. Okay, now, when we talk about total energy intake for a preterm baby, it differs if you are feeding these babies by the enteral route totally, or if you are feeding these babies by the parenteral route totally. If you are feeding the baby enterally, the caloric intake for growth is, that is required is approximately 120 calories per kilogram per day. If the baby is getting TPN, no enteral feedings, you can get positive nitrogen balance by giving 60 calories per kilogram per day with 2.5 grams per kilo per day of protein. This will keep the baby from breaking down their own protein. But if you want to get weight gain on TPN, no enteral feeding, you have to give approximately 80 calories per kilogram per day. Okay, now remember that number because we're going to come back to that number a little bit later. Okay, so here we have, again, another little preterm baby. And one of the issues that we have with these little preterm babies is that many of them have to be intubated. They have lung disease. And with this lung disease, they have the potential for CO2 retention. 
this baby has an endotracheal tube in and is on a mechanical ventilator and has respiratory distress. Does it matter what kind of substrate we feed to this baby in the intravenous nutrition or enterally? Yes, it does. This is a, an equation that I, I'm sure you're all very familiar with. This is called the respiration equation. With the respiration equation, you have one mole of glucose and six moles of oxygen, yielding six moles of CO2 and six waters. From this, you can get what's called a respiratory quotient, which is the CO2s produced over the O2s consumed. The respiratory quotient is six over six or one. That's for carbohydrate or glucose. Here we have a lipid, palmitic acid. One mole of palmitic acid plus 23 moles of oxygen yields 16 CO2s and 16 waters. So we take this 16 over here, and we put it over the 23, and we get a respiratory quotient of 0 0.7. So what does this tell us? This tells us that for carbohydrate, we are producing more CO2 than we are producing carbohydrate for lipid. So why is this important? Well, work that was done in Canada by Dr. John Van Aard and colleagues looked at this in terms of glucose intake in grams per kilo per day, and then looked at carbon dioxide production. And here we see that for increased glucose intake, we start with this kind of a curve, and then all of a sudden the curve goes even uh, at a greater slope. So you have more CO2 production. And right about at this level, which it equates to about 12 milligrams per kilogram per minute of glucose infusion, is where you have this rapid increase in CO2 production. So many neonatologists are using the number 12 milligrams per kilogram per minute of glucose infusion as a cutoff point in terms of uh, how fast we should be giving glucose in babies who have respiratory problems. This is a slide that uh, Dr. Hay showed you yesterday, and I, again, want to reiterate the uh, importance of giving more amino acid early on. And this is uh, work that was done by Patty Thurine and Bill and colleagues uh, reported in pediatric research in the first week of life, three grams per kilo per day, increased the uh, uh, protein balance markedly. Very important point. And this is safe. The BUN does not increase. This is the, one of the major concerns people had of giving more amino acids early on. The point about insulin was raised a couple times yesterday, and I think that this is an important component here of giving low amino acids versus high amino acids. Here, with the low amino acid intake, this is one gram per kilo per day versus three grams per kilo per day, you look at the glucose concentration in the blood, and it's about the same. But here we look at the insulin concentration, and with the high amino acids, we get a greater insulin concentration. So what are we doing by giving more amino acids? It's almost like giving insulin to the babies, just that you're causing the babies to make more of their own insulin rather than actually giving it exogenously. Why is this important? Well, if you look at it from this schema, this uh, point of view, if we have delayed TPN where you, where you are not giving amino acids early, not giving amino acids early, you have low leucine and arginine and other amino acids. That low leucine and arginine and other amino acids decreases the insulin. That decreased insulin increases glucose. Increased glucose causes potassium to go outside of the cell. Okay, so a lot of these babies have hyperglycemia and hyperkalemia, and by giving the early amino acid infusions, you can prevent this hyperglycemia and hyperkalemia. Okay, back in the early 1980s, 
a very uh, well-known neonatologist, and I'm not going to say his name, a very well-known neonatologist, uh, gave a lecture, and this is what he said, intravenous lipids are poison. Okay, uh, and I think that nowadays uh, uh, we still believe that to some extent. And I, I, I also think that uh, the lipids that we are giving to most of our babies are not the uh, optimal solution. I think that there's a lot that needs to be done to improve the lipids that we are giving to our preterm babies. And I think Cami touched on that beautifully in her lecture, that there's a lot of changes we need to make with our lipids, uh, not only in the composition, but how we give them enterally versus parenterally. But I'd like to just uh, uh, go through this a little bit and uh, talk about some of the dogmas that we have. Uh, we use a lot of excuses not to give lipids to babies. Hyperbilirubinemia, sepsis, PPHN, lung disease, liver disease, thrombocytopenia. The evidence for not giving lipids in any one of these situations is either non-existent or extremely weak. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the details. We can discuss that in our discussion sec uh, session, but uh, uh, all of these excuses not to give lipids are either non-existent in terms of the evidence or extremely weak. Here is a different way to look at fat accumulation in the mother during pregnancy, and we see that in the mother in the dark circles here, there's an initial fat accumulation over the first uh, 25 to 30 weeks of pregnancy, and then at plateaus. In the fetus, there's very little fat accumulation, and then after around 30 weeks gestation, there's a lot of fat accumulation. And that fits very nicely with what Cami showed you in terms of this placental uh, transfer of some of the lipids that go to the fetus. So what's some of the rationale that we have for supplying lipids early to babies. Number one, essential fatty acid status in early infancy is low, and it's rap rapidly exacerbated when you do not give lipids. The long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid derivatives from essential fatty acids are important in brain and retinal development, and you want to prevent catabolism and protein sparing. You want to give energy to these babies in this first week. It's very important. Okay, now let's just take a few minutes and review some of the uh, uh, basic aspects of lipid. For some of you, this is going to be, you know, old stuff, but for others, I think that it's, it's important to go over uh, some of the uh, basic lipid biochemistry, just as a quick review, okay? Because you've been hearing a lot of 22, N6, uh, uh, 3, you know, all, all of these, uh, these different numbers. I want to make sure that we are all on the same page and that we all know what we are talking about, okay? So I want to talk a little bit about triglycerides, short, middle, and long chain, saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, what are the essential lipids, and what are the unsaturated types, the omega-3s versus the omega-6s. First of all, triglyceride structure, very simple. Glycerol backbone, three uh, uh, fatty acids attached onto this uh, 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 ester linkage, okay? So that's what a triglyceride is, and 70 to 80 percent of the lipids that we take in or that we give to our babies is in the form of triglycerides. Nomenclature, okay? This is the kind of nomenclature that you see, and I'm not going to tell you uh, exactly what this uh, 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 fatty acid here is, but it's derived from olive oil, okay? And I'll tell you a little bit later what it is. So first of all, we have the number of carbons that represents the first number. The second number that we have represents the number of double bonds. So is this monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, or unsaturated? Monounsaturated, okay? And then here we have uh, the position of the first double bond from the non-carboxyl, the omega or the N-terminus, okay? This is oleic acid found in olive oil, okay? So here's your first quiz. Okay. Don't look at this. This is the carboxyl terminus, 
here we have how many carbons? Count real quick. 18. Okay. Um, what's our next number? Two double bonds. Good. You've got a double bond here and a double bond there. This one doesn't count. Okay. And what's our next number? Okay, the, where is the first double bond from the N terminal? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so this is an omega-6 fatty acid. Okay, and another name for this omega-6 fatty acid is linoleic acid. Okay, if that first double bond was at this three position, we would have an omega-3 fatty acid. Okay, so that's the difference between omega-6 and omega-3. So here we have our two major essential fatty acids, linoleic and linolenic fatty acid, and they're called essential because they cannot be made by the body. You can feed as much uh, medium chain lipid as you want to an individual, but they will not make the linoleic and linolenic acid. They have to be provided in the diet. That's why they are, are essential. The linoleic comes primarily from vegetable sources. Linolenic <coughs> comes uh, in very high quantities from marine sources, such as fish oil. Okay? <coughs> linolenic, it has uh, three double bonds. Yes, three double bonds. And the first double bond is at the three position. That's why it's an omega-3. Okay. So sometimes you will see the omega switch to an N. And I don't know the exact reason for this, but it's slightly different nomenclature. It means the same thing. N or omega means the same thing. But here we have our parent molecules, the linoleic and the linolenic, omega-6, omega-3. And our bodies have the capability they have the enzymatic capacity to desaturate and elongate these two essential fatty acids into arachidonic acid, which is so important for growth in the immune system and uh, membrane synthesis, okay, very important fatty acid, uh, and also the omega-3 series, which desaturates and elongates into our friend over here, docosahexaenoic acid. And you've seen this number before. Ed showed it uh, uh, in his talk, and Cammie showed it in her talk. This is the 22-6N omega-3. Okay, and this is very important in neural and retinal development. Okay, this is a baby who had a little bit of respiratory distress and also had hyperbilirubinemia. And the neonatologist caring for this baby we're very concerned about the hyperbilirubinemia. And because of the hyperbilirubinemia, did not give this baby any lipids for over two weeks. Prior to about 10 years ago, that was very common, and in some places, that still happens. So what happened? This baby here started to have some peeling of the skin. And this is one of the signs of essential fatty acid deficiency a dermatitis where you see peeling of the skin. You can just imagine, if you see this peeling of the skin, what is happening to the rest of the body, the uh, central nervous system, okay, with the lack of these essential fatty acids. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on how we can determine biochemical essential fatty acid. I just showed you a sign of clinical essential fatty acid, but there is a way to determine uh, biochemical essential fatty acid deficiency. And if you go back several years to the 1960s, Dr. Holman, uh, working in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, did some work where he took infants two to four months of age and fed them diets containing different quantities of linoleic acid. Here's a lot of linoleic acid. Here is very small amount of linoleic acid. And then he measured something called a triene to tetraene ratio, okay? These are uh, lipids that can be measured using gas liquid chromatography. 
and he found that if you gave very low levels of this essential fatty acid, you started to get high levels of triene, trienes to tetraenes. This ratio started to get very high. And now it's thought that this Holman index, this ratio of greater than 0 0.2, is considered to be essential fatty acid deficiency. This is actually a question that it sometimes comes up on the, board, on the written board examinations for our uh, neonatology fellows uh, in the United States. What is a uh, uh, biochemical essential fatty acid and what is considered to be a trying to tetraene ratio uh, that is considered to be essential fatty acid deficiency? So uh, I don't know if you need to take board exams or recertification, but this is something that does come up. Okay, so we've got this number, and this is a number that's now been known since the 1960s. And in the 1990s, some neonatologists at the University of Wisconsin took this number and uh, decided that they wanted to determine how long it takes for premature babies, if they are not being given lipids intravenously, to develop a Holman index or trying to tetraene ratio greater than 0 0.2. So they had four groups of babies. These four groups here, one group received no intravenous lipid, had respiratory distress syndrome, was not receiving any enteral feedings. This group here, no IV lipid, respiratory distress syndrome, was getting some enteral feedings. <laughs> IV lipid, yes, RDS, yes, no feeding, no IV lipid, no RDS, feeding, so four groups, but I'd like you to focus primarily over here. With no linoleic acid, no essential fatty acid for the first seven days, the trying to tetraene ratio after one day was 5%, after three days was 15%, and after seven days was 80%. So after one week of not getting any lipids, 80% of these babies had biochemical signs of essential fatty acid deficiency. Here we see that with a small amount of feeding, you could actually prevent some of this, but uh, uh, if, if you were uh, getting IV lipid or uh, considerable feeding over here, you prevented all of it, okay? So small amounts was considered up to 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo per day of intravenous lipid could prevent essential fatty acid deficiency. Very important. Okay, now, let's get back to this, and I told you I would get back to this, the energy requirements in premature babies. For enteral feeding, 120. For parenteral feeding, 80 is a minimum to 100 calories per kilo per day. Now, many NICUs start with IV lipids after the first several days after birth. And then they advance very slowly at 0 0.5, 1, et cetera, every few days. And I think we had some discussion about this earlier today. Where does this come from? Well, in the early days when we started intravenous nutrition in the 70s and 80s, this was, we were very concerned about giving too much lipid. And this method started because we were so concerned that uh, these babies could not tolerate intravenous lipid. And that stuck with us, even though we now have numerous studies showing us that giving lipids in uh, prolonged infusions over long periods of time are actually quite safe. Now let's look at a calculation. Assume that we have a one kilogram baby and in this one kilo baby, we need 80 calories per kilo per day for growth. And we're giving glucose at the quantity, at the higher end of the quantity that Dr. Hay suggested the other day, eight milligrams per kilo per minute. So you get about 39 kilocalories from glucose alone. Then you're giving the upper end of amino acids, three grams per kilo per day, and you get 12 calories. How much lipid do you have to give to reach 80 calories per kilo per day. Well, here's the calculation. 
you need at least 2.7 grams per day for this baby, one kilogram baby. Okay, that's what you need in terms of energy intake. So here's some different approaches. Approach number one, you start with zero lipid and you work your way up and you get 10.5 grams per kilo in the first week. Approach two, you start with three grams per kilo per day starting right away after birth, okay? The golden hour of nutrition right after birth and you have 21 grams per kilo per day in that first week. The difference between these two is 10.5. You do a little calculation here in terms of caloric intake. The calories per kilogram per week difference is 13.5 kilocalories per kilo per day. Now let's get back to this. In the first week, 10 calories per kilo per day gives you this kind of an increment. So if you want to provide that kind of energy, if you are giving almost all parental nutrition, you have to start early with lipids in these babies. You cannot start late if you want to provide that energy intake early on. Is this safe? Well, we have a lot of studies that uh, uh, suggest that this is safe, but, but this is a study that actually uh, Dr. Hay showed uh, yesterday, and I want to just reiterate this study. This is the, the work that was done by Ibrahim and colleagues where they looked at 32 ventilator-dependent preterm infants. They looked at them prospectively and randomized them into two groups with early TPN with three grams per kilo per day of amino acid and three grams per kilo per day of 20% intralipid starting within one hour of birth. The late TPN group started on a solution containing glucose during the first 48 hours of life, followed by two, kilos, uh, two grams per kilo per day of amino acid and 0.5 grams per kilo per day of intralipid. Uh, for the uh, uh, low group, the amino acids and intralipid would each increase by 0.5 grams per kilo per day to a maximum of 3.5 and 3 grams per kilo per day, respectively. What did they find? Plasma levels of cholesterol triglyceride, bicarbonate, blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, and pH were similar in both groups during the study period. And this study shows that aggressive intake of amino acids and intralipid can be tolerated immediately after birth by very low birth weight infants. Also, the higher group significantly increased positive nitrogen balance and caloric intake without increasing the risk of metabolic acidosis, hypercholesterolemia, or hypertriglyceridemia. Monitoring triglycerides. How many of you monitor triglycerides routinely in your preterm babies? Once a week, okay, routinely. Uh, maybe uh, quite a few, okay. Now let's, let's talk about this a little bit. There are different norms that are recommended by different authors, okay? Uh, if you look at some of the books, some authors recommend 100 to 150 as being the top level. Others say you should keep the triglyceride levels less than 200. Is this efficacious or is this realistic? If you look at some of the textbooks, they make you think that every change in lipid that you give, you start with zero and then 0.5 and go to one, they make you think that you should really be checking your triglyceride levels with every single change that you make. That every time you think that the baby has sepsis, you should be checking your triglyceride levels. If you have that attitude, you will be drawing a lot of blood from babies and also incurring a lot of costs. Does this make sense? Well, let's look at what happens to formula-fed babies and their triglyceride concentrations. These are eight-week-old uh, uh, infants with uh, looking at triglyceride concentrations after formula feeding and human milk feeding. Here is the uh, uh, 158 is the mean triglyceride concentration, minimum to maximum is 81 to 327 right after feeding. Human milk fed, 164.5, minimum to maximum, 59 to 418. 
Okay? So we sometimes see high triglyceride concentrations in babies who are being enterally fed. Okay? What are we going to stop? What are we going to do? Stop feedings in these babies? Okay? So I, I think that uh, uh, we need to have some uh, uh, further discussion and thought about when we should be starting lipids and how we should be giving to these babies, lipids to these babies. And I think a, a, a good strategy is to start lipids as soon as possible. There are really no good studies, to my knowledge, that show that there are problems if you start at three grams per kilo per day right after birth. In most babies, usually not more than three grams per kilo per day need to be provided. In some babies, certain individual babies who are not growing very well, they may need a little bit more than that. Hyperlipidemia is tough to monitor. We don't know very much to do with these results. I think Cami brought up a study that she's aware of uh, 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 suggesting that there might be some cardiovascular problems later on. But are these cardiovascular problems due to the lipid infusion or are they due to some problem that is endogenous in those babies in, to begin with? I don't think we have the answer to that. And if you do give a lipid infusion, it should be prolonged over as long as possible and less than 0 0.2 gram per kilo per hour should be provided, okay? And less than that, uh, less than 0 0.2 gram per kilo per hour certainly gives less than, uh, it will allow you to give three grams per kilo per day. Uh, I've had questions uh, given to me in, in previous conferences about oils applied to the skin. And I think that this is a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, issue. And uh, some places in South America are using oils applied to the skin very commonly to provide lipids to uh, preterm babies. They, they slather up the skin um, of their preterm babies. But studies have been done, at least two studies have been done to look at this in terms of essential fatty acid uh, deficiency and prevention of essential fatty acid deficiency. And these studies show it does not work, okay? Bottom line, it does not work, okay? Can we minimize the use of intravenous lipid? And I think Cami was beginning to allude to this, and I think this is uh, uh, where we should be going in the future. Uh, these babies, she showed very clearly, are deficient in DHA, and they're deficient in some of these other long-chain fatty acids. And do we need to give omega ven to these babies? Can we actually be using some kind of an enteral preparation? I've been talking to formula companies for over 10 years now, uh, trying to get them to, uh, to develop something that we can give to our preterm babies uh, by the enteral route rather than the parenteral route. Uh, still not there, but I think that they're slowly beginning to be, become interested, okay? Uh, giving lipids uh, fish oil to mothers. That was brought up before. Yes, you can increase the quantity of uh, these long chain fatty acids in the breast milk of their mothers. But these preterm babies are not being fed very much in their first week by the enteral route. So even if their mothers have very high quantities of uh, DHA in their breast milk, if they're only being fed 5 cc's, 10 cc's per kilo per day, they are not getting the kinds of DHA quantities that they actually would need. So this is certainly a, a route that I think we need to talk about. Now, what about using the gastrointestinal tract in preterm babies? Can we feed this tiny preterm using the gastrointestinal tract? What are the consequences of not feeding the baby? And how can we go about enterally nourishing a baby like that? Well, talked about TPN, and uh, certainly TPN is something that has been uh, very, very helpful to us uh, uh, in uh, providing uh, these babies with nutrition early on. But we sometimes forget that these babies do have a gastrointestinal tract. And the fact that they have a gastrointestinal tract means that 
we can use it. We may, might not be, use it, be able to use it to provide complete nutrition to these babies early on, but we can use that gastrointestinal tract safely, and if we don't use it, we might actually lose some of its function. No food in the gastrointestinal tract, Bill showed this to you yesterday, can cause problems. Mucosal atrophy, TPN-associated sepsis. We think that a lot of the uh, sepsis, the late-onset sepsis, that we see in our preterm babies comes through lines. But think about this. The gastrointestinal tract has the largest surface area of the body. And that gastrointestinal tract, when it gets broken down, is exposed to huge numbers of microbes. Those microbes can translocate into the bloodstream, okay? So you can have gut-associated translocation and seeding of the bloodstream. I think that this is something that uh, uh, surgeons have known for a, 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 for a long time, and I think we're starting to begin to recognize that as neonatologists. But gut-associated sepsis may be uh, much more prevalent than we think. So with these, you have a lack of trophic hormones, systemic inflammatory response, decreased mucosal IgA from the Peyer's patches, and increased adhesion molecules and white blood cell attraction. If you attract a lot of white blood cells to an area, it's like bringing in a lot of soldiers and a lot of tanks and uh, ammunition to an area. And if you l bring in too much, what can happen? You can all of a sudden have damage occurring, collateral damage occurring, okay? And that can happen in the GI tract, okay? So this is Dr. Elsie Widowson who about 60 years ago did some very interesting studies. And Dr. Widowson looked at uh, feeding piglets right after birth versus not feeding piglets right after birth. And she found that if you feed piglets by their mother's milk, suckle them, they gain, their duodenum gains 42% of its weight in the first 24 hours after birth huge increase in size of the gastrointestinal tract with that uh, uh, 24 hours of feeding. If you don't feed the, 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 these uh, piglets right after birth, they do not, their intestine does not gain weight. This is a trophic effect on the gastrointestinal tract. Here's another study that was done at, in Texas, uh, and I think Cami actually referred to this study. And this is a, uh, a study that's very interesting in that uh, what they did, they took a intravenous solution, a, a solution that is used for uh, in, uh, uh, intravenous nutrition, and they fed it either enterally or parenterally, the same solution. Here we see enteral intake, no enteral intake, but all of the intake here was intravenously. All of the intake over here was enteral, but no intravenous, and these are the gradations in between. And then they looked at these piglets uh, at uh, intestinal tract. Uh, they looked at their DNA, their protein, and their wet weight. And we see here that as you increase their enteral intake to about 40%, that's when you start seeing a plateauing of their DNA, their protein, and their wet weight. So that suggested that you get a trophic effect, but you don't get the maximum effect until about 40%. Now, these studies have actually been repeated using a non-TPN solution, okay? Uh, more of a formula, a regular type of formula solution, and you start seeing this effect much earlier than at 40%, okay? So the point is that Putting food into the gastrointestinal tract increases the weight and the growth of the gastrointestinal tract. Not putting food into the gastrointestinal tract causes atrophy. What about some of the GI hormones present in the plasma of babies who uh, get fed and who do not get fed? This is work that was done in the mid-1980s by Dr. Alan Lucas and colleagues, and they looked at uh, five different 
GI hormones, enteroglucagon, very important trophic hormone, gastrin. This is a, a, a insulinotropic polypeptide, gastric insulinotropic polypeptide, motilin, and neurotensin, okay? This is the level that they found at the time of birth in these babies. If they were unfed, okay, green is unfed, after six days, there's no change. If they were sick or if they were fed, a marked increase at six days. So putting some food, and this is uh, small amounts, around 20, less than 20 cc's per kilo per day, something that we now call minimal enteral nutrition, increased these uh, uh, gastric hormones, these intestinal hormones. What about um, the superior mesenteric artery blood flow when you feed a baby? Someone asked me uh, yesterday about um, dopamine. Do I feed a baby when they're getting dopamine? Well, let me ask you, do you feed babies when they're getting indomethacin? Yes, yes. So most people say yes, okay. There are many neonatologists. In fact, there is a guideline in the state of New York not to feed babies while they are on endomethacin. Okay. Now let's look at this. Uh, from a physiologic standpoint, not a study standpoint in babies, because we still don't have very good studies in babies on feeding with endomethacin. This is work that was done in piglets, also universe, uh, at, at Baylor University. Here is timed from start of TPN or enteral feeding. And this is superior mesenteric artery blood flow. Okay? Enteral feeding, superior mesenteric artery blood flow over here. You stop the enteral feeding, what happens to the superior mesenteric artery blood flow? It drops. Okay? So, Let's say that this is a, a, a baby, a preterm baby. You're giving it enteral feeding, and you decide, oh, I better give this baby some endomethacin, or I better give, the, the, give this baby some dopamine, okay? The concern with endomethacin and dopamine is that you constrict some of the blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract, okay? So if you are constricting the blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract, with endomethacin or dopamine or epinephrine, and you stop the feeding, what are you doing? You're exacerbating the situation from a theoretical perspective, okay? So I think that this is something we should keep in mind, and uh, I, I tend to agree with most of the people here. I do not stop the feedings with endomethacin. What about when you, uh, the uh, leakiness of the gastrointestinal tract? We talk, uh, talked a little bit about leakiness of the gastrointestinal tract. And what is the difference between if you are giving TPN versus giving a small amount of food in the gastrointestinal tract? Well, this question was addressed by Drs. Uh, uh, Shulman and uh, Chandler uh, back in the uh, late 1990s. And at that time, this was uh, 14 or so years ago, in the United States, it was very common to not feed a baby, to put food into the gastrointestinal tract for two weeks, sometimes three weeks. No food in the gastrointestinal tract for two to three weeks. So at that time, this was considered totally ethical to not feed some babies enterally. So they had two groups. One group, TPN only to day 15, and another group that was getting some parenteral nutrition, but was also getting a small amount of food through the gastrointestinal tract, trophic feeding, GI priming, less than 20 milliliters per kilogram per day. And then they looked at permeability of the gastrointestinal tract using lactulose to mannitol ratio. Lactulose is a sugar that if you give it into the gastrointestinal tract, uh, it will not Go, it will not be taken up into the gastrointestinal tract and passed into the bloodstream, okay? Uh, mannitol also should not be taken up by the gastrointestinal tract or passed into the bloodstream. If there is a permeability problem, 
mannitol will be able to go through the cells and also into the intercellular junction between cells. Lactulose, if there's a permeability defect, only goes through the intercellular junctions. So if you have a breakdown of the intercellular junctions, if you have a leaky gut, you will see an increased lactulose to mannitol ratio. And so here we see in the TPN only group a leakier gastrointestinal tract than in the GI priming group. So that, and this is at 10 days. So small amount of enteral nutrition decreases the leakiness of the intestine. This is another study that was done in piglets looking at the livers after seven days of enteral nutrition, this is the control, and seven days of IV nutrition. Very different looking livers, okay? Only seven days. H&E sections, ballooning of the hepatocytes. This is fat staining, a lot of fat staining and glycogen staining, okay? After only seven days. We now have several studies of minimal enteral nutrition. There's at least studies, uh, 12 studies of minimal enteral nutrition, and all of them show some kind of a benefit, but no increase in complications such as necrotizing enterocolitis. So next question is, how do we feed these babies? What are the recommendations to feed these babies, and uh, do we have some evidence basis here? Well. Guidelines are very important to have in a neonatal intensive care unit. And recently we have revised our guidelines at the University of Florida. And uh, I'm going to give you some of these guidelines here. We initiate immediate IV access with day zero hyperalimentation. So in other words, as Dr. Hayes said, we have bags in our refrigerator that are ready to go as soon as a baby is born. Okay, bags of TPN solution, and these contain glucose, and they contain amino acid, okay? Um, after, uh, okay, uh, we, we switch this uh, to pick lines shortly after placement of the pick line. So we will start with a UAC or UVC catheter as soon as those are placed, and then once we have a, a, a pick line in place, we will usually switch to a pick line. As far as fluids, we will initiate 80 to 100 milliliters per kilo per day, and you can piggyback additional fluids if more than 100 milliliters is uh, needed. And we advance 10 to 20 milliliters per kilo per day for a goal of about 130 to 150 milliliters per kilo per day of total fluid. Dextrose. Start with a glucose infusion rate of around 5 to 8 milligrams per kilogram per minute, and you advance slowly. The goal is to get up to between 10 to 12, but not to go above 12, especially in babies who have lung disease, who are on mechanical ventilation. Um, the amino acid that we use is trophamine, and we initiate in our very small babies uh, uh, three to four grams per kilo per day of amino acid. And the way this is done, uh, we start with, uh, in, uh, on day zero, we start with a 250 mil, uh, milliliter bag that contains glucose, 7.5% glucose uh, for babies that are less than 1,000 grams, and 10% for babies that are greater than 1,000 grams. And in those bags, we have 9.4 grams per 250 milliliters of amino acid. That provides around three to three and a half grams per kilo per day in this infusion rate. So again, IV lipids, we start immediately after birth with three grams per kilo per day. Maximum we will give is, uh, is about 3.5. It's rare that we will give 3.5, but occasionally we will do that. And we try to maintain a continuous infusion of lipids over 24 hours. In some cases, we may have to stop the lipids for a period of time because certain infusions may not be compatible 
with those lipids. So we may have to stop the infusion for an hour or two hours to provide those medications that are not compatible with the lipids. Just uh, the uh, electrolytes, day one to two, we do not give electrolytes on day zero, but day one we will start with some sodium, some potassium, just some numbers here that uh, we generally will use uh, for the electrolytes and the minerals. And this is very complicated, but I I'm more than happy to, uh, to provide this for you. This is an algorithm, okay, of nutritional guidelines uh, uh, that we have recently uh, uh, developed. Phased approach for enteral nutrition. Minimum enteral nu nutrition phase, you initiate at a rate of less than or equal to 20 milliliters per kilo per day. And again, here we are talking primarily about babies that weigh less than 1,250 grams, okay? There, uh, we are talking about our small babies. If you have a 1,500 gram baby, and if that 1,500 gram baby is doing well, you may have that baby on full enteral feedings in four or five days, okay? So you do not apply that to a 1,500 gram premature. You can keep the minimal enteral nutrition for three to five days without advancing, but you may consider slowly advancing over five days. This is not something that uh, uh, has to be exactly the same for every single baby. A 500 gram baby is not the same as a 1,250 gram baby. So I think that there is some room for clinical judgment here. Then that we have the advancing phase, advanced by up to 20 milliliters per kilo per day and as tolerated. Why do we use this number 20 milliliters per kilo per day? Well, that comes from studies that were done at Case Western Reserve University uh, by Drs. Uh, Kligman and Anderson. And uh, we are sort of stuck with that 20 for the most part in many neonatal ICUs because when they looked at, uh, uh, retrospectively looked at their babies, those babies that were getting more than 20 milliliters per kilo per day had a higher incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. Some subsequent studies have been done. Subsequent studies have been done and have looked at higher intakes with no necrotizing enterocolitis. So I, I think that uh, uh, if, you, if your experience has been very good with advancing faster than that, don't stop, okay? Don't, don't, don't go down to 20 milliliters. Keep on doing what you're doing if your experience is very good with that. But this is just a, a, a guideline that we have been using. Uh, in our unit, we will advance feeds and decrease TPN accordingly, and we, we discontinue lipids when the enteral feeds reach 80 milliliters per kilo per day. And we discontinue the other components of PN when the enteral feeds reach 100 to 120 uh, milliliters per kilo per day. Just general guidelines. Then we have a, a fine-tuning phase where breastfed babies, we fortify the human milk with fortifier when 100 milliliters per kilo per day of enteral feeds is reached. Now, that's what we do, but I, I'm not, I, I think that it's certainly reasonable to also start fortifying earlier. As Dr. Bell mentioned, that's what they do at Iowa, and I think it's totally reasonable to do that. This is just our guidelines and we have developed this because our nursing staff feels that uh, our babies seem to have less uh, feeding intolerance when we do this. When PN is discontinued, we fortify the breast milk to 22 calories uh, per ounce, and fortifying this with uh, human milk fortifier, we add one packet to 50 milliliters of, ex uh, of, uh, of the breast milk. When enteral feeds reach 140 to 150 milliliters per kilo per day, we fortify to 24 calories per ounce. And this is just uh, uh, the kind of fortification that we use here. So, some take home messages. Early nutrition in premature babies can be safe and efficacious, and we can prevent significant morbidity. Many of the dogmas that have prevented rapid incorporation of early nutrition have either been disproved not based on fact or are very weak. <laughs> nutritional guidelines, and I think you should all have some kind of nutritional guidelines in your neonatal ICU, can be very helpful in maintaining consistency and improving nutritional care. Thank you.
questions? Should we have uh, uh, the panel up here? Uh, uh, or? Well, go ahead. Yeah. So, sir, when you are feeding extreme premature baby and he's on medication like you mentioned, dopamine or in the seed, mm -hmm. what would you take in consideration to stop feeding of this baby? I mean, the abdominal distension, the residual of the previous uh, meal, what you could take in okay, consideration? Uh, oh, this is, this is a, that's a great question. Okay. Uh, let me get on to uh, talking about gastric residuals. Okay. What's a, what's a normal gastric residual? 50, 60 percent. Okay, you're feeding, you're, you're, you're okay. Wait, wait, let me talk. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're giving, you say 50, 60 percent, okay? And you're giving the baby two milliliters every six hours. I just wanted to know what's your point. Well, let me, let me continue here, okay? Uh, I, I'm, uh, you, you, you raised some really interesting uh, points here, okay? Uh, so gastric residuals, uh, it, they depend so much on uh, uh, how much you're feeding. In the early days when we did our first minimal enteral nutrition studies, when we were not feeding babies by the enteral route at all, okay, and we took gastric residuals from these babies, we would find two, three cc's of gastric residuals in babies who weren't being fed at all. I think it's not sense, the residual. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so most of our babies get fed eight times a day, okay, if they're being fed every three hours. Uh, some units feed every two hours, some units feed every four hours, but in our unit, we feed our babies in general every three hours, okay? So when the nurses do the gastric residuals, each time they do a gastric residual, they have the tube in the stomach and they pull out and sometimes you see them pulling really hard, okay? So what does that do? Uh, you have to think that usually there's a little bit of gastric mucosa that's attached to those holes, okay? So eight times a day. The other thing is that um, uh, oftentimes they look at the gastric residual and it looks like it's digested and it, and it looks yucky, okay? And because it looks, you know, it doesn't look very good. They throw it away. Well, you can give it again. And what do they do when they throw it away? You've got acid, which is important. You've got pepsin. So, but if you give it again, if you give it back, then you're at least replacing what was there before. Okay. Yes, but do we have evidence that it's nonsense? Okay. Uh, there's very little work that's been done on gastric residuals, okay? And this week in our unit, we have started a randomized control trial of looking at gastric residuals the way we usually do versus not looking at gastric residuals. We were actually able to get this uh, through our human subjects board, and when I first presented this to the nursing staff, they said, <laughs> what? <laughs> you're, you're not going to do gastric residuals? Uh, this is, we've been doing this uh, for our entire careers. So uh, this, uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. We, we are just starting this study now. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get some, some uh, interesting information in this gastric residual study. So your next question. About the abdominal distension. Okay, abdominal distension I think is a very important sign. Yeah. Very important sign. And uh, rather than using gastric residuals, I think we should really be examining the abdomen more. You know, feeling the abdomen, uh, listening for bowel sounds. Bowel sounds themselves are not that, uh, that helpful. But, you know, just putting your hand on the abdomen, I think that there's a lot to be gained from doing that. If you see a real change from one point to the other, that's very important. I think that that's much from a clinical perspective, much better than a gastric residual. Uh, both, both, yeah. Uh, the, the problem with the measurement is you have, you know, three different shifts of nurses coming in, and so you may have differences based on the, uh, on the nurses. Then your other point was uh, how do you determine if you're starting to give indomethacin or if you're starting to give uh, um, some of these uh, medications, 
uh, how do you determine if they're having any problems? I, I think you just have to look at them clinically, and the gastric residuals do not help you from that perspective. And what I presented was physiologic data that makes us need to think about uh, what we are doing when we stop the feedings. We could actually be doing exactly the wrong thing, and we do not have very good studies to guide us whether we should be continuing feedings in these babies or not, okay? Uh, many of us, as I saw, many of us continue feedings with indomethacin and uh, uh, dopamine and some of these other medications. The evidence showing uh, increase in necrotizing enterocolitis with dopamine alone, with indomethacin alone, very, very weak or non-existent. Uh, one thing I think, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow, is uh, intestinal perforations these uh, uh, isolated intestinal perforations with giving indomethacin and glucocorticoids together. Very, very dangerous procedure, okay? If you do that together, you don't want to, uh, you, you have a, a very high likelihood. But is that related to feeding? Most of those babies have never even been fed that uh, develop the uh, uh, intestinal perforations with the combination of those drugs. Never, you never examined the mother's milk for the protein level? Okay, that's a very good question about uh, examining the mother's milk for the protein level. I, I think that uh, uh, the protein level in the mother's milk can vary a lot. And very early milk in the first uh, couple of weeks has much higher protein levels than later on. And so the, pr the protein levels can vary over longitudinal period of time over months, and they can also vary if you check the protein level in the morning versus at nighttime. You can have marked changes in protein and fat level. Do we measure that? We don't, okay? There are some places that are beginning to look at that using uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, newly developed technologies. And I think that that may be something that uh, other units will begin, to, that, that some units will begin using uh, with a lacto-engineering kind of an approach. Uh, but most of us do not have that technology available to us yet. Exactly how we are going to modify milk based on that is still a, a, a big question. I, I think that there are companies like the Medela Company uh, that are beginning to work on technologies that actually will uh, take baby's own mother's milk and concentrate or uh, uh, dilute it to a certain level uh, of lactose, protein, lipid, uh, that uh, uh, will provide for uh, uh, more engineered type of approaches for that particular baby. We're not there yet. This is, uh, this is, this is the future. Good question, though. second stage, for how many days do you stop feeding or you don't stop? Well, I, I think we're going to talk more about neck tomorrow, but how many days do we stop feeding? I think uh, uh, when you have a stage one necrotizing enterocolitis, I, I want to just uh, uh, tell you right offhand, stage one, I don't know what, it, what that is. I, I, I don't know what stage one necrotizing enterocolitis is, okay? Uh, it can, stage one can be so many different things. It's, uh, it's a very low birth weight baby undergoing normal processes in a neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, stage two, stage two is medical necrotizing enterocolitis, okay? So if you have stage two NEC, usually stopping feedings for about five to seven days, okay? Some places will stop it for longer. Depending on the clinical status, some people will use uh, CRP levels. Okay, and seeing what happens to the CRP levels in terms of uh, the length of antibiotic treatment and uh, 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 feedings. I, the studies that uh, uh, support that I think are non-existent or very, very poor. There are some studies looking at that. But for the most part, five days to 14 days with a stage two. Stage three is uh, such a different disease depending on the baby. I mean, they can have short gut. They can have, uh, you know, uh, uh, immediately anastomosed uh, uh, gastrointestinal tract uh, that you can start feeding within 
10 days very readily, but some babies uh, uh, have a very, very different outcome with stage three. So it's highly variable. Do we measure IFAB? Okay, very, very interesting question. And I, I don't know if, uh, I, I actually do plan to bring that up tomorrow. IFAB is intestinal fatty acid binding protein. And uh, intestinal fatty acid binding protein uh, is a, uh, a biomarker that uh, can be found in the blood or can be found in the urine. <clears throat> and uh, studies that have been done in uh, uh, Netherlands have looked at uh, intestinal fatty acid binding protein. And this is a, uh, uh, a protein that is found primarily in intestinal epithelial cells. That if the intestinal epithelial cells break down, it's a water-soluble molecule that gets into the bloodstream and actually can be seen in the urine. And the IFAB uh, is, uh, when you look at it in terms of the studies that have been done in the Netherlands, uh, their sensitivity, specificity, uh, area under the curve looks really, really good. We do not measure it, to answer your question. But I think that uh, uh, this is, it looks very promising. And uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, personally start uh, uh, looking at this more closely. Are you guys going to tell you a study that we have done? Please. And find any differences. <laughs> okay, so say that again. You measured IFAB in? Growth-restricted infants with in abnormal Doppler results. Okay, so growth-restricted infants with abnormal? Doppler. Doppler, Doppler results. results. Okay. Okay. We didn't find any differences, unfortunately. And, and, no, and babies without, uh, without clinical signs. And we didn't find any differences. Are you disappointed? No. <laughs> Let me ask you, are your Doppler results good markers? Well, I, I, I think that, uh, and we'll discuss this more tomorrow about uh, uh, blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract and the, the, uh, the hypotheses behind necrotizing enterocolitis. And the uh, ischemia, <coughs> primary ischemia, and that's what you measure with Doppler blood flow is primary ischemia versus secondary ischemia. And the primary ischemia is probably not that major of a factor with the development of necrotizing enterocolitis, the classic form of necrotizing enterocolitis. The classic form of necrotizing enterocolitis, you probably have more secondary ischemia, and it's not highly dependent on the superior mesenteric artery blood flow that you measure with Doppler. Okay, the, 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 there's more than one necrotizing in, w w disease that we call necrotizing enterocolitis. I think that this is, this is a very important point to remember. The classic form of necrotizing enterocolitis is probably not something that you would measure with Doppler. Please, can you tell us something about the two different modalities of uh, enteral nutrition, discontinuous versus continuous, because yeah. in our unity we have the habit to feed early, the very preterm newborns, but in continuous. Yeah. Um, this has actually been looked at uh, with a couple of studies, and I think that uh, the, the study that Dr. Chandler did, looking at continuous versus uh, 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 bolus feeding, suggested maybe a slight, slight advantage with the bolus feeding. Uh, but again, that was, uh, you know, on the border of statistical significance. And I, I, from a personal standpoint, I don't think that there's uh, that much of a difference uh, from, the, uh, from the studies that we have. But eventually, the babies do have to go to bolus feeding. And from a physiologic perspective, bolus does distend the stomach a little bit. Okay? And with that distension of the stomach, you get the release of certain of these uh, trophic hormones. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, physiologically speaking, bolus seems to make more sense, and you eventually have to get the babies to bolus feeding anyway. So is it necessary to give uh, uh, continuous feedings? Probably not. May I ask something? Yeah. 
um, growth restricted infants have a reduced capacity for protein synthesis. Uh, is this, as far as TPN is concerned, is this an education for special treatment like amino acid and administration? And in that case, what about renal function? Okay, this is a question that Dr. Hay can answer much better than I can because he's done the research on it. So the question is, in the uh, intrauterine growth restricted babies, what kind of uh, protein should we be giving to these babies? Should we be giving them uh, the same kind of protein we would be giving to a uh, uh, ELBW baby that is not growth restricted? Is that so? That, that's the main question. Bill, could you maybe address that? Uh, that's a good question. I touched on it yesterday, but the research is, the research is still being done. Um, theoretically, uh, growth restriction. Uh, that's chronic suppresses the capacity for protein synthesis from amino acids. And so you might want to be cautious about giving amino acid doses of the three to four gram per kilo per, rate, per day rate. Um, but beyond that, uh, I don't think we could say because we really don't know at birth, even preterm birth, how long a particular baby has been growth restricted. If the baby looks very small, um, and really does plot way below the third percentile, and everybody says this is a very small growth-restricted baby, um, I think more people would be cautious about going above two to two and a half grams per kilo per day. Um, but it's still the case. If you give less than one and a half grams per kilo per day to any baby, uh, they will break down their own protein and uh, will lose more muscle mass. So I think uh, the, the current balance is just to be a little more cautious, but the data is still yet to come from good studies. I think in the States you have available uh, human milk fortifiers <coughs> proceeding from human milk at uh, different protein concentration levels. From from human milk. Yes, I yes. mean, Prolacta mm -hmm. yeah. fortifier. Yeah. The Prolacta is uh, the... Is that yeah. widely used and is used to individualize fortification? You know, it, the uh, paper that came out uh, uh, last year caused a, uh, uh, quite a bit of excitement. In fact, that, that uh, Dr. Sullivan is one of my colleagues at the University of Florida. She's the first author. And this was a multi-center trial of giving uh, human milk fortified human milk. And... Uh, uh, they found on secondary analysis, you know, not, this was not their primary outcome to look at necrotizing enterocolitis, but on secondary analysis, looking back, they saw this difference in necrotizing enterocolitis. And so uh, I think that to, to some extent, you have to be somewhat skeptical of that study. Uh, it does raise some interesting questions, and I, I think that uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, look at more data. The problem is that they have been trying to repeat that study, but they repeated the study, and again, they did not take necrotizing enterocolitis as a primary outcome. The reason why is because you need large numbers of babies in each group, hundreds of babies in each group, to have necrotizing enterocolitis as a primary outcome. So uh, whether that is uh, something that uh, uh, is going to be uh, uh, highly prevalent or not, I don't know, but it's extremely expensive, okay? It's, uh, I, I can't remember the exact price. To, uh, Bill, Cammy, do you remember the, uh, the exact price of Prolacta? I think it's something like uh, $60, $70 for a couple milliliters. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's extremely expensive. Uh, some studies have been done looking, doing a cost analysis is if you develop necrotizing enterocolitis versus giving prolacta, uh, you know, uh, very artificial kind of a situation. So I don't, yeah. Ed? Uh, did they show reduced? Did they show reduced necrotizing enterocolitis relative to what? What was their comparison group? I don't remember. Oh, relative to a, uh, uh, a group, th this is, uh, you, you bring up a really important point they had a, an inordinate high necrotizing enterocolitis rate in the control group, much higher than most places, even in the United States. I think it was something like 13%. Was, was the control uh, an, 
A bovine fortifier or was it a formula? Uh, bovine fortifier. Okay. So both groups got human milk. That's, yeah. 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 So I, I don't, I'm not sure if I answered your question uh, completely yet, but no, it is not being that commonly used. Okay. There are some units that, uh, that, Seem to have religion uh, for for the uh, uh, for this product, uh, but I think that uh, at this juncture it is not being used uh, uh, routinely. Are you using it at all in your unit, uh, Ed? Okay, Cami, are you using Bill? Are you guys using Prolacta? No. Thank you very much for your very clear guidelines on PN. I'm coming back on PN. If we want to give our very, very small uh, premature babies in the first days of their life, three grams of amino acids per kilogram per day and about 2.5 to three grams per lipids per kilogram per day, we have to use uh, dextrose uh, 35 or 50% because otherwise we have to give uh, much more than 100 cc per kilogram per day of fluids. So I that's don't understand. what we, we you, do. You can, in babies, that, uh, what we have been doing is using a, if the babies are less than 1,000 grams, 7.5% yes, yes. dextrose solution. We can't, we can't do this because I, otherwise we need uh, much more fluid because our, our amino acid uh, solution, Vamin, has not dextrose in it. It's water for injection. Okay. You can actually uh, uh, add. Do you want to? Well, yes, yes. So we have, uh, uh, okay, that, that should, we don't start with something that is premixed. We start with something that is water. Yes. You add the amino acids, you add the dextrose. The pharmacy, if we ask for 6.3% dextrose, we can yes. get 6.3% de okay. dextrose. The pharmacy will mix that for us. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Lunchtime.